everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Living with Jesus series. I am Brittany Shawley, and today I'm here with Brother Josh Wilson. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Hello to everybody listening in. Um, living with Jesus today. Living with Jesus today. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to diving into your story. I'm Really looking forward to hearing more details about being part of the Jesus Revolution in the 70s. Um, but I figure we'll just start at the top and run through and just see where Jesus carries this conversation for today. Beautiful. So the first question I have for you is just talk to me about your relationship with Jesus. Like maybe give me an idea of like what it was like in childhood and what led to kind of a shift in your relationship with Jesus and then what it looks like today. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a, a Protestant church that uh, my family had founded on Central Avenue in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the area was growing rapidly. It, uh, it was a, a time of great fun, activity, uh, new things happening. And uh, there was a great music program there. And uh, I started studying music and I was in my first choir when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just grew up singing um, all these praises to God. I, I felt a very real presence of God come upon my life, believe it or not, when I was five years old. I can actually remember the time where I started developing a relationship. But then, you know how it goes. We, we grow up, we take some left turns and some U-turns and fall in some ditches, and I later on found myself as a music student at Arizona State University, which is was kind of overwhelming. It's the largest university uh, in the United States and happened to be where I was living in Tempe next to Phoenix, Arizona. But it was during that time of real soul searching where I personally felt the presence of God come down upon me and I began to study the life of Jesus as a college student, reading uh, passages like from Isaiah and from Luke, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the meek and to lift up the downhearted and bring joy in the place of sadness. I realized that was Jesus's ministry uh, because I read about it when he spoke in the synagogue, when his ministry started. And then that was the word that was given to me. And I said, well, I guess it means just go and do likewise. And, and that launched me out. I was almost like a rocket with a, a fuse lit. And, and I've been going ever since. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Um, this is almost uh, leaning me into the questions of, so when you felt like the spirit of Jesus upon you? Like, did you feel that it took you like away from church, closer to church, more closer to the people? Like, what did that kind of transition look like for you a little bit more? Well, I immediately uh, made an appointment with my, my pastor and uh, went and spoke to him about it. And I don't think he was quite grasping what was going on. And, but I knew, because I, I'd grown up there and wonderful people, but I realized it was time to, to launch out. So, uh, you know, that, there's more to that story. But, I mean, I, I literally forsook everything and, and dropped everything, uh, education, um, work, uh, the place I was living, and, and, and launched out into a new experience, which I didn't know at the exactly at the time that there was this Jesus movement going on. But of course, I found out quite quickly, and that's what the movie, The Jesus Revolution, is about. And so my hair started to grow long, and I had this big red beard that came out to about here. And I was off uh, hitchhiking up the coast of California and actually living that experience. So I, I became close to the people. And um, to my brothers and sisters and those uh, that were like myself, going through an awakening. It's like a great awakening for a, a good part of the country. Mm. 
Beautiful. I, I love that so much. So you're, you're saying that you had your own awakening that then led you to realize there was this more of like a bigger awakening of Jesus going on at the same time. Right. Which I did not know about. Mind blowing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so it was like, I was, you know, like pl plucked out of the fire, so to speak. And, um, brought into this uh, relationship i felt like i was under a big waterfall when this happened i mean it was palpable it was it was incredible i was just trembling under this power of god I just threw myself into um you know, i said well i'm gonna have to read about the life of christ and find out what this was about and, and yes you're right Brittany. it was not much time after that i realized there was like a a wind of the spirit that was blowing across the land. So beautiful. I'm really interested in your decision to be like, okay, like I drop everything as I had it set up, like my work and my school and things. And you just like go on this adventure that mirrors my story. Like me and my partner did the same thing when the spirit of Jesus came upon us and we just like let everything go and like just started to build this completely new life. Um, and I, I know a lot of people who are feeling like they really want to do that, or at least in some degree to do that, but they feel trepidation and uncertainty to take that leap of faith. What do you think it was that made you know, like, you know, like, you know, that that's what you needed to do for yourself and for, for Jesus? Well, uh, you know, those people that you're speaking of that have some trepidation, uh, if, if you, if you or anyone listening has one foot on the dock and one foot on a boat, and the boat's starting to take off, I suggest that you go all the way and that you hop on the boat. <laughs> and you will not be happy uh, if you're trying to uh, negotiate between two positions. And so for me, how it happened is I was just, um, you know, a young man. I, I, was, I was not even 20 years of age yet. And so uh, I took the, what I read in the Bible, literally, probably too literally. <laughs> and so when it said that the apostles you know, forsook, gave up all that they had, I thought that that's what I was supposed to do. Now, that actually is not a proper rendering. <laughs> not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, but I, I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> so when I read it, it's just like, Hey, I'm going to be like an apostle, you know. And like I said, my hair was growing out, and we had uh, a Christian friend of mine, and and I had rented uh, a little house uh, near downtown Phoenix, uh, and so we just started taking people in, mm -hmm. and uh, winos, people we met, and people we were we we're talking to, and so I would get up in the morning, and I would have to walk over bodies that were sleeping, lying in the living room to get to the kitchen. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that was going on. And uh, and then, you know, then I was getting more into this forsake everything for Jesus. So I I called all my friends over and I, I put a trash can in the middle of the, of the living room. And I says, look, uh, I'm heading out. I'm moving out and take anything you want. And whatever you don't want, it's going into the trash can. So just take something. And um got rid of all my materials and and then it was just a set of clothing a bible a wallet with almost no money in it but it had my draft deferment card because the vietnam war was going on that time and i was a conscientious objector and my little volkswagen that i had just overhauled and i set out on an adventure and uh I was not satisfied. So by the time I got up to Oregon, I think it was, went up through California, there's, of course, communes and Christian activities starting to happen and mass baptisms. And and so then I uh, I signed over the little Volkswagen to uh, some people that, that were in commune. So, okay, good, check, you know, got rid of the car. And then I traded all of my clothing with another brother um, that was up there because I kind of needed, you know, winter, wintry type clothing because I was up in Oregon now. So that made sense. But also, I mean, I was that literal. 
I was getting rid of everything. I even completely changed my outfit. I got a nice uh, leather jacket out of the deal, though, so it worked out okay. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, at that point, I mean, okay, now I was, and I was so happy. I was trying to get other people to go along with me. I said, this is so fantastic. What a life, you know? And uh, so that's how it happened to me. It was it was kind of literal. But then, of course, the spiritual and the inner transformations were the real thing. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. It is almost like, yes, beautiful. I love that so much. Okay. So this question, um, I think I know what you're going to say, but that's okay. How do you see Jesus? Like, who is he to you? Like, if someone was like new to Jesus and you were like, this is who he is to me, like, what would you, how would you explain that? Like, who is Jesus to you? Jesus is very uh, uh, personally present to me and not, not a force of the universe, although he is because he's the creator of the universe along with the universe mother spirit. But as for me, uh, the presence, the person of Jesus is so close, because especially since the day of Pentecost, when this, the spirit of truth came upon the whole world and the whole planet. We're in a new dispensation now for the last 2,000 years. So the spirit of truth is very present with me and guiding me, and Jesus has a lot of responsibility because he's literally, not figuratively, running an entire universe of things, beings, planets, um, epics, eras, uh, projects, beings of all kinds, you know, archangels and Melchizedeks, and uh, it, this goes on and on. I mean, so he's he and the universe, Mother Spirit, have a vast family. So I'm just one member of the family, but it's, it's like I was the only person in a way because of, of his personal presence with me. So that's it. Best friend, walking hand in hand, um, thought by thought. Love it. I love it. Like the language that I have on that is like, you're like the spirit, like the spirit energy is like with you, like guiding you directly. And like, that's the mm -hmm. language that I've come to know as the Holy spirit through a course of miracles. And then you're talking about like Jesus, like being in control of like all of this stuff. And to me, that's like, he's the head of the atonement, right? Like he is the one who knows what's right. going on. And right. but at the same time, it's personal because it's not like he's some force or power outside. He's it's a literal personal, direct, intimate, holding my hand side by side. I got mm -hmm. you, you know, right. daily life experience. Yeah. And there's so much safety in that and comfort in that. And like, mm -hmm. you, you can trust that. Um, so I love hearing you express it like that. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, this one, this question, I, I love hearing people's answer to this question because it kind of gets us like to peek inside that. So you say much like myself, that it's a personal relationship with you and he's like in your everyday life. So how do you include Jesus in your everyday life, your everyday work? Like, how does he show up for you? Like, do you have practices that you do? Do you, is there prayers that you do? Is it just like an inner knowing a tuning in? Like, how does he live with you in your everyday life? Well, that experience of being a, a Jesus person and, and kind of a hippie and, uh, I mean, hitchhiking, I, I had no money for a year, hitchhiking up and down the coast, that changed because I, I met my dear, lovely wife, now passed. It turned out her grandparents had founded an orphanage, Christian orphanage, they were ministers, and uh Kind of on the edge, outside the city limits, it was up against the desert, one of the suburbs of Phoenix. And so I was suddenly thrust feet first into a, a life of, of growing responsibility. So now it was uh, the work had to be done. And now I was had to totally rely upon Jesus, wake up every morning praying, hitting the ground running and I cooked breakfast for these, these orphans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, we had a 110 people living on 110 acres. Wow. And so we, we were taking care of about 70 children in six different homes and the staff's children. 
So I'd, I'd cook them all breakfast and so I'd get up very early. Then I would uh, hold prayer um, devotions for the children. They would do their chores, take care of their animals. We had a 4-H program. And uh, so by the time they got onto the school bus, uh, we felt we'd already almost put in a full day's work. <laughs> it, was, it was that involved. And then I would conduct the uh, the morning prayer meeting. So sort of answering your questions, you know, how does this unfold? I mean, for me, I, I led, I guess, over 3,000 of those prayer meetings, uh, if you add them all up. And we would have uh, spiral-bound notebooks. We'd write the prayers for a lot of things to pray about with that many children and, and disturbed families that were associated. And then when the answers would come, we would write the answer down on the margin of, of the uh, of the notebook and many, many answers to prayer. So, so that's how it works to me. It's just been a whole lot of work <laughs> and uh, doing the work of God. And we were there for about 20 years. Wow. Beautiful. That's, yeah. That, that mirrors my, not that I've been, you know, the head of an orphanage at all, but that was my experience as well, that when I kind of like let go and I developed my faith and trust in Christ, then he gave me a lot more work to do and a lot more responsibility. And I'm like, right. holy, now I'm like working every day for the kingdom. I'm not just flying by the seat of my pants. Everything's fabulous. Um, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> becomes, you know, really foundational work. So I love hearing okay. that. Um I also want to highlight something that I think is really important that I think is a gem takeaway of what you're saying is that you would specifically I actually got this question this morning. Like, do we, can we pray for other people? And I was like, of course you can pray for other people and just like asking, you know, God for, for help and for answers to these prayers. And I love that you not only prayed, but you then received the answer, like the prayer answer and wrote it beside the prayer. And to me, that that's, that's how this universe works. It's an ask and receive universe. So when you pray and you ask, like there's an answer if we allow ourselves to, to listen for that. And so I feel like that's just um, a beautiful, like tangible uh, takeaway um, from what you shared there. So that's really beautiful. Great. Let, let's, let's spell the word ask. A S K ask, seek, knock. Ooh. And it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Now you know and you'll you'll never forget those three parts now. Because now no, you know. never. A S K. A S K. Oh yes. I want to tattoo that now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. Um, cool. So in regards to this, uh, like very like direct relationship with Jesus and these laws of the universe, like what would you say is perhaps maybe some of the mistakes that some like students or followers, you know, of Jesus have made along the way, um, that maybe we can kind of like highlight and, and, um, yeah, just kind of like see and, and bring up for today. There's various kinds of mistakes, like uh, wrongly thinking that my own thoughts w was the voice of God. I mean, give me a break. You know, but, but a lot of people will, oh, you know, God spoke to me. I mean, yeah, I mean, that happens. But if, if that is so easily, when we have our own thoughts translating that and think that's like divine guidance, that could be a mistake. Uh, it could be a serious mistake that could... Uh, set a person's um, pathway uh, way off track. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, and then I think you know, probably the other one that I notice a lot is just <sighs> the mistake, the problem of of losing losing personal contact and getting discouraged mm -hmm. because we're living in a world that's in in, in the rip tides. Uh, a, a tornado, a hurricane, riptides of transition right now. Very serious, troubling times for a lot of people. So it can get disorienting for many. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's too easy to, to, to lose um, that vitality, mm -hmm. that personal relationship, not only with God, 
but people, especially after the these couple of years of COVID, uh, hiding away in their homes and and losing contact with other people, yeah. and and maybe only having it on a two dimensional level of social media and uh, uh, other means, and and now the things are loosening up, not getting back into personal contact on a daily and weekly basis with family and friends and developing good habits for daily and life and seasonal transitions and even annual events so we don't feel rootless. But these are some of the big problems that, that I've been seeing and, and that I'm trying to help, do what I can to help as a minister to, to lift uh, everyone that I come in contact with. Great answers. Um, I, I feel like I want to flush those out a little bit more because I think it really is also a big mistake, like you're saying, that a lot of people will take their own thoughts and think that that is the thoughts of God or like inner guidance or whatnot. And I feel like that's why in, in my work as well, like my teachings, like I'm such a big advocate of mind training and mm -hmm. just learning how to truly meditate and pray and to like recognize the difference between guidance from spirit and your own thoughts. Um, and so what would you say is um, like a, like a good sign that perhaps maybe it is coming from spirit and it is coming from, you know, our, our higher mind instead of our lower base thinking ego mind, like what, what might be something that can help us to discern between the two in your experience? Right. There is within every person within you, Brittany, within me, everyone listening, everyone we know, even children, there is a pilot light, you might say, uh, an inner compass. And uh, I like to use a, a Urantia book term called the reality response. Mm -hmm. It's about that simple. God is real. The things of the universe are real. Everything contrary to that is um, constantly in a state of entropy or fading. Uh, the, the real things of truth, beauty, and goodness are growing and energizing. And if a person during their meditations can do the kind of mind training that you're talking about, in which A Course in Miracles uh, leads us to, if we can do that, we will develop time and time and time again a habit and a facility to have the reality response, and we will know. Uh, this is a day of deep fakes uh, coming on the, the TV screen and uh, uh, artificial intelligence like chat GPT generating things. You don't know where, where did this come from. But this problem has always been with us. It's just that the game has been up right now and it's getting into more serious proportions. But the solution, the answer is the same. So to answer your questions, how, how could we know? A daily development of habits of prayer, faith, and trust will bring a person to where that reality response is now being paid attention to. And it becomes more obvious that if something's not re real, reality-based, fake in other words, or a substitute or a counterfeit, or it could be an inner um, a kind of a belligerent self clamoring for attention that's skewing this ability to listen to the still small voice, be still and know that I am God. Yes. Beautiful. That's definitely like is almost exactly what I would say as well. And it's like, it's an attunement. And the more we do pray and have that faith and that trust and listen, like to me, inner listening is so important. Then we have the experiences that we know are real, real, real. Like I can resonate with you when you're like, wow, it was like a waterfall. I had a very similar experience. That I'm like, oh my God, how could this not be real? Oh my God. <laughs> Um, but I feel like the more that we have, not even, it doesn't have to be big experiences, just little tiny experiences. They, they really do set us on a path to recognize it 
in other people and what they're saying and recognize it in ourselves and recognize it in what we see. And it's like, it's an attunement to that capital R reality that is inside of all of us. And I feel like that is one of the most important skills that we could learn at this time um, because it's, it, it, it is the key to honestly, like salvation to joy you know, to really being able to live here authentically and not be taken in by the chaos and the uncertainty of the world at this time. So um, it's really good. (laughs) Beautiful. So one of my last questions here is speaking to those who are, well, I think I just asked that question, but just a different way of saying it. Um, because my original question that I generally like to ask is like, what do we say to people who might be like unsure of Jesus and like on the fence, like one foot in one foot out, but I think we've explored a lot of that. Um, Mm -hmm. so maybe I'll just kind of like open up the, the space and the floor for you. Like, is there anything that you feel, um, is coming through or any words of wisdom that you feel would be helpful to people who are listening today or that they, yeah, that, that, you know, come through today. First request. Go see the movie, The Jesus Revolution, while it's still in the theaters. Oh, you're going to love it. Because The Jesus Revolution, tell, we called it The Jesus Movement, uh, that tells the story uh, so well. And oh, the day that it opened, I, I went with my oldest daughter. I have three three uh, grown daughters and, and several grandchildren. But, and, and one of my best friends, we just went right away and saw the movie because I came out of there. I mean, we were, we were in tears during the movie of, of joy, happiness, uh, uh, reverence, worship. And, and it told the story. I was there. I, that was my experience. That's what happened to me in the 1970s. So how can we uh, help people to get uh, further into relationship. Oh my, there's so many good ways, but I, I would I would say that the first thing is just be kind of on the spot, moment by moment, and and don't delay. Go ahead, and when you're talking with someone and then you see an opening, it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, I had I had my air conditioning repairman come out. Um, it was a couple of days after I'd seen the movie. And he's there, he's working on it and, you know, adjusting wires and stuff. I just started telling him about it, mm-hmm. you know. And the weirdest thing was, um, I, I, he's been my air conditioning guy for a while, but he was talking to me about a certain way that he made his coffee with these these mushrooms. And uh, within a very animated gesture, he went like this with his hand. And he says, when you know something that works you want to tell everybody. And the weird thing, Brittany, was when he put his hand up like this, was behind his hand, he couldn't see it. He was pointing at a picture of Jesus that I had on the wall. It was done by a, a, an artist friend of mine. <laughs> so what am I going to do? He's telling me when you know something works, you just want to tell. And he's going like this. <laughs> so I just had to start talking to him. And then, <laughs> then the next day, I, I I was talking to a nurse that was coming over to help somebody. And I was telling her about it. You need to take you and your husband and go to this movie, see the Je- Jesus Revolution. I was there. It happened. It was real. It was revival. And we got another revival going on now. Students at multiple universities are getting baptized in fountains at at the uh, you know on the university campuses. Well, that's what I was doing back there in the seventies. Same thing. We just we just we were using a baptism at a thing pool or uh, facility at a church, and they said, you know, you just using this thing too much. And there's towels left around and stuff. We just can't keep going like this. And so we we started uh, baptizing in swimming pools. That's what we were doing, and so. I'm just saying, you know, use every opportunity to share with uh, your loved ones. When when you come out of that prayer place and 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 you're lifting and guiding your your husband, your wife, your children, your family, and those around you, and then let those in concentric circles move out and and share with everybody. That's how a revival happens. Jesus said, "You the wind blows and you hear the sound of it in the treetops." 
and you see it, but you don't really understand it or know where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with those who are born of the Spirit. Mm. And so when you share something, you know, I told you that great story about how I was converted, but I didn't tell you what happened 30 minutes before. 30 minutes before, my college girlfriend and I were having a spaghetti dinner, and she told me the good news of Jesus. And I went home a different person than I was when I went into the restaurant. And so I got home, and I says, wow, I'm a believer now. I guess I should read the Bible. So I pulled the Bible up off the shelf that I brought with me from home, and I opened it. And that's where I read, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's when this waterfall came down. So how would that have happened, you know, if she hadn't taken the opportunity? It wasn't the first time. We didn't know, we'd known each other for years, but it finally got through to me. So please um, share share what, what you have found, and whatever it is. Maybe you just know this much about it. Whatever, where, whatever your level is, you just share what you have, what your experience is, and you don't know. Something, water could turn into wine. Uh, it might go into a person, it may seem very plain to you, but it might come out, you know, with these life-giving properties and and, and change, human and spiritual change. I don't oh know if, if I answered the question or if I got off on a tangent there, but I mean, I'm pretty excited about it. Oh, you answered the question perfectly and it's inspired me in so many ways. So I have to jump on that bang wagon. But like, first of all, yes, like you're saying, like share the good news, share the good news. And I think your example with the air conditioner brother who kind of basically gave you a sign by the way you did. It was a sign. Totally a sign. It's like, I, I'm ready for it. And I feel like if we are open and willing, like we will be used and we can like pay attention to those signs in, in just our life, even going to the grocery store and running into somebody there or the parents at school or like wherever, right? Like you get these little openings that allow you to say. And I think what you're saying too is just have the courage to say it, just have the courage to speak because we don't know how that's going to affect their life and, and change their life in a positive way. So if you've had experiences that have changed your life and like you're saying, you can believe in Jesus this much, that's enough to start sharing it. And in my experience, the more you give, the more you receive. And that like sharing is the ultimate lesson because when I've given myself permission to allow myself to share these, these truths that I'm experiencing and learning in my life, that's when I get to hear it come through me. <laughs> and it even further confirms it in me as I'm giving these nuggets of wisdom to whomever it is that I've run into. So like that is so important. And the Jesus Revolution movie. I'm just going to share this for people because I don't think I've shared it widely. I've shared it with you already. But what is incredible about the timing of all of this is my family and I were just in Vancouver last week and our flight ended up being canceled. Totally fine. Um, but we went to a hotel. Um, our daughter had been asking to swim. So she got to swim in a swimming pool, which was amazing. Um, and But it was really cool because our hotel room ended up being like not even five minutes away from one of my now dear, dear friends, Greg. We have an interview on my channel with each other. And um, he randomly was like, hey, like, I was wondering if tonight you wanted to go see the Jesus Revolution movie with me and my mom. And I'm like, yeah. Wow. I didn't even know it was in theaters. I, I didn't know it as a possibility at all whatsoever, but I went and saw it with him and I too was crying and just like so filled with the spirit because of it. And I had no idea that that movement had happened in the seventies. Um, and then I think what's beautiful is that I meet with you this week. We just connected yesterday and you share with me that you were in your own way, part of the Jesus revolution at that time. And there's just been so many synchronicities since that if I didn't see that movie, I wouldn't have the context to even right. be able to relate to what it is that you're talking about. But now that I have the context, oh my gosh, I could put myself there. And in a sense, like even just putting myself there mentally and just 
like emotionally, I could tune into that. And that is such a power because it's the collective power of the people as God's children that are really just saying yes to, to this beautiful truth, reality, capital R. And that is the, like you're saying, turn water into wine. That's what moves mountains. That is what transforms things and allows heaven on earth to be a reality for us. Right. And so I just feel like this is the catalyst, like the energy that's needed. And I want to just also agree that I feel this revival is happening. Like you're saying with the churches and Nashville and stuff like that. Yeah. Like it's happening. I feel it. I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my relationships. I see it on a global scale. And even though simultaneously, like we can see all like the wars and the chaos and the separation politically and all this stuff, we have to remind ourselves that beyond like that, that can help us to almost like crack our own shell, crack our own egg. So we can look beyond it and see what's really, really happening. Like the Jesus revolution, the Jesus movement, the revival, like it's going on. And if we lock ourselves into that, we're part of the solution. We're part of the answer. Yeah, you're right, uh, Brittany. It's happening big time. The wind is blowing. Um, the wind of the spirit is not the first revival that swept across the United States. There, there have been others. There was a time in New York City, early, much earlier on, <clears throat> when there were so many prayer meetings going on that businesses were closing uh, every day from 12 to 2 o'clock p.m. Mm. for prayer. You go up to a uh, a business assigned, you know, closed for prayer, and they're often, you know, at prayer meeting. I mean, see, we don't know about this history. Right. We did. We've all even just forgotten what happened a few years ago in 1970, but now we're reminded. Right. But we also forget these others, and then there's other revivals going all the way back to the times of the apostles. We have not been left without a witness and without the blessing of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, the, the movie, The Jesus Revolution, which uh, stars Kelsey Grammer, who his life is really dedicated to Jesus, too. If you read his interviews mm -hmm. since then, this is the guy that was on that TV show called Friend. Uh, no, um, I'm trying to remember. I, I'm not that much of a TV aficionado, so I can't I quite say. But anyway, yeah, this famous actor, Kelsey Grammer, he's the one that played Pastor Chuck Smith in the movie. Right. Okay, so... Uh, He's, he's come out with a wonderful testimony. And then um, I don't know if you use uh, the tomato meter or, or rotten tomatoes that that the one that tells you, you know, how the movies are. Or, you know, well, the audience score for the Jesus Revolution is 99 percent. Whoa, uh, that never happens. <laughs> yeah, that never happens. You might get 95, 96 or whatever. But the, the funny thing is, kind of predictably, is that the uh, critic score was only 59%, but the audience score was 99%. <laughs> yeah, so it kind of gives you a picture of what's going on, but also is an indicator to, to all of us to not pay too much attention to the, what our culture is saying to us about what's good and what's worthwhile, because God has spoken and the people have responded. And and know in their hearts what is what is the real thing, and uh, living with Jesus uh, is the real thing. Yes, Amen, Hallelujah, <laughs> thank yeah. you, Jesus. Oh my God, beautiful. I I I'm so lit up by this conversation, and I feel that this is going to just continue to further allow the ripples to extend to all the minds and hearts who are listening in on this conversation today. So thank you to those listeners for being here and having an open heart and mind to to hear this conversation. Um, and thank you, Brother Josh, for everything that you've done for Jesus all these years. And thank you for continuing to be such a bright light that we could be inspired by through you. Thank you, Brittany. Yeah, thank God bless you. you all. God bless you too. Bye, everyone. <laughs>